How many years can one man remain clean? How about 32? Yeah, can you believe it? It's been a great path and a great story for Dennis. Restoring hope. He's here. Tell us his story. Open my heart to sing. Taking the darkness inside. Revealing your light. Restoring hope. Open my eyes to see. Good afternoon. It's the third day of August in the Lord's year 2015. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is Restoring Hope Live, courtesy of the good folks at Powell CDC. If you've always wondered what you're going to do about Uncle Bob or that niece or nephew or that friend, maybe it's somebody in your Bible study, maybe it's somebody next to you cubicle at work, what are you going to do? There, there's an addiction issue. There's an alcohol. There's a drug issue. There's something. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to bring it up. They might get fired. They may not love me anymore. They may not come to family reunions. If I call somebody, are the police just going to come over and arrest them and I'm going to start this whole mess? I don't know what to do. Well, that's why we do this show for you. Lila Stafford, Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat, myself are here today. We're going to be talking to Dennis, who's got 32 years sobriety, clean, in recovery, an active participant in a recovery program, and you don't have to worry about men in white coats coming out and grabbing you. You don't have to worry about the police coming. You don't have to worry about apathy or pity. How about empathy and help? That's what they can do at Powell. 263-2424 is the number. And uh, if you think you want to talk to somebody about yourself or a friend or someone else you know, that's the best place to go. All right, Dennis is here with us, 32 years in recovery. 30, you must have been what, 12? <laughs> Bless you. Uh, no, I, I was uh, 27 and a half. 27 and a half. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's go back in time. Where are you from? I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. You're from Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah, I, I was birthed over at uh, Methodist. Okay. And uh, what high school? I went to uh, two. I went to Tech High back in the day and did the little radio and television there, too. And then I was at North, and I graduated from North High. All right. And um, you, you make it clear when we talked earlier that you are 32 years in recovery, not sober. Right. Now, does that mean you didn't have an alcohol issue? Well, I uh, see. I the the program that I'm involved with in does not differentiate between a chemical. Uh, you know, the 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 thought is uh, we suffer from a disease, and it's called addiction, okay. and it can break out in many many different ways. Whether it's a chemical that happens to be a liquid form that's legal, or it can be a chemical of some sort or another that's illegal. Our, our bodies don't really know the difference, but with as far as our addiction goes, and it doesn't know any difference either uh, if we're having a food issue or we're having a gambling issue or we're having any other kind of issue because the disease is addiction. It's obsession, compulsion, and self-focus, uh, self-centeredness. That's the disease. That's the issue. So I'm an addict. What do you got? You know, give me, what do you, what yeah. do you have? I'll, I can use it and abuse it and go to the extreme <laughs> with it. So uh, sober is too limited a term for us. Yeah, because sober is usually directed only at alcohol. Right. And, and uh, we don't focus on one thing. Yeah. Well, we do. It's the disease of addiction. All right, so if I talk to you about your drug consumption, if I talk to you about your alcohol consumption... Which is a drug. Okay. The that, oldest known. Okay, but that's all, that's all part of your story? Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So when did you take your first drink? Well, I was probably... I was kind of a later bloomer. It was probably about 17, thereabouts. And yeah. do you remember it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, remember it very well. Felt wonderful. Tell me about it. Well, it was like a, it was an ex, a euphoric experience, and uh, you know, I just felt so uh, light and lightheaded, but I felt just really free to kind of be uh, who I was holding myself back from being, which is just really, really open and and gregarious and so forth. We're, I was a little shy and withdrawn. So you were shy. Yeah, believe it or not, I am actually 
I've, I've trained myself to be outgoing. Okay. It's not it's not natural. Okay, me. naturally cuz outgoing, you're a wonderful outgoing guy. Well, Funny guy, sure. nice to be around, friendly Thank face. You. Thank you. But you got to work at that. You're telling. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's become part of who I am now, but it wasn't always. So what kind of kid were you? Uh, kind of afraid of life. I mean, I was a fun kid. I I re- remember my parents talking to me about, you know, how I was, and I'd see pictures and so forth, and I'm, I'm very loving, and and uh, you know, res- I learned respect at an early age, and treat you know treat my elders with some uh, respect and so forth, and treat other people like I would like to be treated, and all it was it was that kind of a family, and that's how I was taught. But uh, but I also was just a little shy about putting myself out there. And uh, I felt lonely a lot, and there it came from a deep inner kind of a thing, not not something that I could really put my finger on that uh, some one thing happened or several things happened that made me feel that way. I always felt that way. I was raised as an only child, and uh, I whoa, whoa. felt you were. Ra- are you an only child? Well, it turns out I'm not, but I found that out after I was forty. My mother was. Uh, within a few years of her death, and she finally uh, co- told me that I had a half sister okay. that she had uh, birthed in 1946, and uh, that she gave up for adoption. And she had she had her there at Methodist Hospital too, as a matter of fact. And uh, we've since met, and we, we you oh, know really? we're in good connection with one another. And I've met uh, all of my uh, nieces and my nephew and their kids and all of that, and it's great. But uh, I I didn't know anything about that until much later on in my life, well into my recovery. So I was raised as an only child, okay. and I al- always felt lonely, lonely, and I would do anything. To have friends, including I take my toys and I would manipulate them to have, to be my friend because I didn't feel like that just me myself was enough. What, so way back that that addiction starts. Dennis, yeah. tell me whether this term applies. Dennis felt unlovable. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Tell me about mom and dad and growing up as a only child. Well, my father um, was. Uh, uh, raised in, in uh, he was born in uh, Valley Junction, 1925. Uh, he was raised uh, basically on the streets of Des Moines, Iowa, back during the Depression. Uh, his father had left him when when uh, he was young and was raised by his grandmother and his mother. And uh, he uh, started smoking cigarettes when he was nine, started drinking at an early age, and uh, he, he was an alcoholic. He was a Marine in the Second World War. He was called back in Korea. He was in Korea as well. They didn't have much to deal with people back in those days. And how did he deal with it? He drank. And, uh, you know, he was married once before. There, both of those children died at early birth. And uh, then he was divorced, and he married mom, and they had me. And, uh, you know, between that and my mother lo- losing a child, you know, that she gave up. Uh, and all of that, there was that going on, that dynamic. So I was taken care of very well. I, w- I had asthma, asthma from birth. I was an asthmatic, lifelong asthmatic. And so I had to have health problems a lot. And I learned to eventually manipulate that. If you want to call that my first drug, it was, because my addiction came out in being a hypochondriac. And I was. And a yeah. hypochondriac is somebody who steals? No. No. A hypochondriac. Oh, go ahead. No, just someone that thinks they're sick all the time. Yeah, and truly, oh. and truly oh. believes it to the point that they manifest physical symptoms. Okay, and you did that to get attention. No, well, sometimes, yeah, I suppose I did. I did it a lot though to avoid life okay. when there was issues and problems and things that I felt afraid of and, and and disconnected with and so forth. It was easier to remain in my own little world. Okay, because I knew everybody there. And Dennis doesn't feel good today. Dennis has a tummy ache. Dennis has a headache. Yeah. How old were you when that started to happen? Mm-hmm. It really started to happen when I was about nine. Mm-hmm. And continued until uh, well into my adulthood. Really. Well into my adulthood. It wasn't until I found recovery, and then even a few years into that, just a few, but then my reco- the recovery process, the spiritual principles, started working in every 
aspect of my mm-hmm. life. Did anyone ever confront you with that? Like, oh, nothing's really wrong with you? Or did your parents try to take you all to kinds of doctors? Sure, or? absolutely. All of those things. Yeah. All of those things. But denial is strong. Mm-hmm. And fear is stronger. Yeah. Fear is the strongest. Yeah. I only believe in two emotions. What? There's fear and love what? and there's fear. Because from fear comes anger, resentment, yep. hate, everything else. Yeah. So, and, and you know, uh, FDR said it best, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Mm-hmm. So I do truly believe that fear is a motivator, but it but keeps But you have to understand lying. fear, and you um, need someone else to really help you dig through that because you don't know that's what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because a, as our recovery program says, our best thinking got us here. <laughs> our best thinking says that in our book. Our best thinking. So if our best thinking, I can't see the forest for the trees. I have a brain disease. It's in here. How can I possibly be able to know yeah, when you're that what I'm believing thing. is the truth is actually the truth? Mm-hmm. I need some outside um, other sources. I need you know other. Um, uh, what is it? Dimensions, in, yeah, yeah of, of that to be able to to get a feel for okay, am I on the right track or am I on the wrong track? And I can't know that for a fact without that. You know, step four, you have to list your fears. Right. And I remember doing that, not being in touch with my fears at all. And I wrote down <laughs> I was afraid of flying in a plane. <laughs> not ha- and then <laughs> when I got help but with you know, writing what what fears I really had, my life was was totally around you know geared around fear, sure. and I had no idea that it was that way. Right. Yeah. Any spiritual life as a child? Oh well, see, <laughs> my mother was a Quaker, but my father was a Catholic. He was a fallen Catholic, you know, one where he'd been married in the church previous and then they divorced, but it wasn't through the church and he was considered kind of like excommunicated. But he had had a long-term relationship with a priest that later became the Monsignor at uh, St. Ambrose and uh, Monsignor Lyons. I remember him well. Anyway, um, so I went to Catholic school up through eighth grade, and it, but it wasn't my dad's decision. They left it to me. Would you like to go here? Or would you like to go? And of course, I wanted to be more like my dad and so forth. So I did. I went to, I went to Catholic uh, school. Uh, St. Ambrose Cathedral was my church. Um, I, back in the days, uh, the earlier days when they still spoke Latin, and uh, then during the time when it changed and so forth. So, so I, I am kind of into, if you will, uh, certain uh, r- religious um, um, trappings, I guess. Uh, but I, I, I know that all of those things are just kind of like icons and to get me more uh, emotionally, spiritually connected. So there's many paths to the same source. And it really doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it may matter to you. You may have a different belief than I, and that's perfectly fine. But uh, for me, it doesn't matter how you get there. It's that you get there. Mm -hmm. That's the key because it's a basic universal principle. And the paths are many, even within certain sects of religions. Christianity has many, many different sects of that same religious belief. And some of them differ a little bit. So you would call yourself a Christian? Yeah, I'll call myself a Christian. But I'll also call myself a Buddhist. But I'll also call myself uh, 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 an Islamic. But I'll also I'll call myself many things because I'm not, not any of those. What are you? Well, uh, if I had to put it in... Uh, a term I'm a monotheistic free agent (laughs) Dennis is our guest he's been sober for 32 years since the 28th day of May in 1983 and we'll hear more about his path and his journey as we continue today on Restoring Hope Live brought to you by Powell CDC and those good folks all over there waiting to help you and yours I'm J. Michael McCoy and this is The Truth 99.3 
From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. A father who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Hi, I'm J. Michael McCoy, and about 20 years ago, I went to a used car salesman by the name of John Hewitt. He had a little shop over there on North 2nd Avenue called John's Auto Sales, and I bought a car. I found that experience to be one that I had never had before from a used car salesman. He was honest, he was dependable, he had integrity, and he did what he said he was going to do. Well, over the years, between my kids and grandkids, I purchased seven vehicles from John's Auto Sales. And last month, I asked him to be a sponsor. I can tell you about their huge selection. I can tell you about their years of experience. I can tell you about their honest integrity. But all I really need to tell you is that I bought seven cars, and you can trust them. John's Auto Sales, 5435 2nd Avenue, Des Moines. You need a good ride when you hit the trail. Trust the man with the cars, and he goes by the name of Big John. Big John. Big John. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Good afternoon, 3rd day of August in the Lord's year 2015. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is Restoring Hope Live. Recovery Monday brought to you by Powell CDC. It's the day when which we start the day, uh, the first show of the week, uh, for people who, um, well, you witnessed something over the weekend. It probably wasn't you. It was probably something you witnessed. You went to Adventureland, and your brother was along, and your brother hasn't you haven't seen your brother in a while, and he brought his kids, and he's got a real nice wife. And, and you noticed every time you passed a beer stand, uh, your brother went and bought a, a two-fisted, two-fisted, you know, one in each hand. And he also had a little flask that he kept in uh, his pocket, and he poured that in the beer every once in a while. And as you went on ride after ride after ride after ride, he got goofier and goofier and then angry and then mean. And, oh, my, he has a problem. And you'd say something to the wife, and... She'd be embarrassed, and her, her eyes would look down, and maybe she'd tear up. And, and you know there's something to do, but you know how to do it. You don't know what to do with it. You have no idea where to call. Well, you have a place to call now. Powell, CDC. What does CDC stand for? Chemical Dependent Center. Chemical, as Dennis said so well earlier. Not just alcohol, not just drugs. Chemical. Because we're allergic to some chemicals. I'm allergic to alcohol. You can say, oh, Mac, that's convenient. You just drink too much. No, I don't drink at all. Because when I did drink, I'd have a terrible reaction to alcohol. And the stupidness would come out. And the foul mouth would come out. 
and the very unloving mouth would come out. And horrible things would be said to the people that I love the most. And those are the people that need the help. And I'll tell you that until they want to get the help, they're probably not going to reach out. But at least you know where to go now when they are ready. Powell, CDC, 263-2424, part of Unity Point. You know, Mac, when you said you were allergic to alcohol, I, I found out I really am. I had a blood test done and all the things that go into, into alcohol, I'm allergic to. Really? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. neat. But not the yeah. alcohol itself. No, but Just, like barley, mm-hmm. all that stuff, right. all wheat the, stuff, and yeah. What did that say to you? That all along, I, you know, I should have paid more attention to my body <laughs> throwing up. Shouldn't we whatever. all have paid more attention? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I may just get horrible, horrible hangovers. And, you know, that alone is saying this doesn't belong in your body. Yeah. Well, we all figured out in a different way. Now, Dennis, you said you uh, went into recovery at 27. Yeah. But as we talked earlier, you weren't a big party boy in high school. No, but w- I made up for it. Okay. I promise you. I made up for it. Tell me yeah. about that. Well, I mean, it was uh, it was alcohol, at fr- and I drank like a fish, and, and I loved alcohol. Uh, you know, I, I loved my beer. And I became a connoisseur, and uh, I, I loved my wine, and then I became a connoisseur, and then I started loving my my gin, and I became a connoisseur, and uh, tequila, and I became a connoisseur, and of course uh, Johnny Walker Black, and uh, you know, and it just went on and on and on, and then I'm starting to drink various things together. I wasn't like you; I didn't get sick. Mm-hmm. I wish I had. No, I didn't get sick. So I would just drink until I blacked out, and then I was doing crazy things that people had to tell me about later. Um, and, you know, that, that was the drinking part of it. But then I smoked dope. You know, I, I smoked like a fiend. And I didn't smoke cigarettes either, but I smoked uh, dope like a fiend and opiated hash. And, uh, of course, I did downers, lots of downers, because I was always kind of at... at you know, at a certain point, animated and that kind of thing, and very outgoing. In fact, people who used to come up to me and say during that time that didn't know me, they'd say, uh, "Do you have any of that? I'd like to get some." And I I'd used say, to have people, and I'd say, uh, "This is me. This is the way yeah. I am normally," and they'd back away. But uh, <laughs> so, do you have ADD? Huh? Do you have ADD? Uh, I think I probably did. Mm-hmm. You know, I I probably did, mm-hmm. and uh, but you know, of course, I'm completely undiagnosed, but. Uh, and again, that was another one of those things, uh, fears of not relating and that sort of thing. And that's mm-hmm. the way I escaped as a child through the, the being sick all the time and so forth. So, but, but I would do all the, the, the smoking and the drinking and uh, uh, taking downers and, and uh, because it wasn't that up high that I needed. It was go, how low can you go kind of a thing. So, and I, you know, I really tried to get there and into oblivion state. And, uh, and then I, I took a lot of LSD and I took a lot of mushrooms uh, psilocybin mushrooms and uh, different things like that. And at first, when I started those things, believe it or not, the same way with the smoking of marijuana and so forth, I, I was actually seeking out what my spiritual path was because I, from about 13 or 14 on, I had given up on uh, at least Catholicism. And I was searching out other uh, sects of Christianity, and I was talking to, and I was also talking to rabbis and priests and lay people and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and just you know anybody. And I would talk to them in in great depth and detail, uh, trying to find that path. And then and then I started seeking out other religions and Eastern religions and so forth. And so when I started doing some of those drugs. I truly had believed in my own mind that I was trying to seek a higher spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was 90 miles an hour into a brick wall, but I didn't realize that at the time. And after a while, it was no longer a spiritual thing. It was just that I want to get high and escape. I I want to not feel anything. I think that's common with most people that use is that they don't want to feel. Yeah. Because the feelings hurt too much. Dennis is my guest this afternoon on uh, May 28th of 1983. Where were you? Well, he was giving it up, plugging the jug, turning it over, surrender life and will to a God of his understanding to try to put his life back together. Now, what happened between 
high school and, and 27. Did you get married? Uh, no. Well, I did get married, but that was like toward the end of that, uh, 27. Uh, I got married, and it was one of those marriages that if you blink, you miss it. Yeah. Uh, kinds of things. I, I think it was, uh, looking back, it was the last ditch effort that I was making to try to find some normalcy in my life. She had a three year old. So I'd be like instant daddy, uh, instant fa- you know, father, instant husband, instant everything. Because good addicts, we want instant everything anyway. We want, <laughs> we want it and we want it now or we want it yesterday and hurry up. What are you doing? Why don't I have it? That's the kind of way we think. And uh, so I, I think at some level that's what I was trying to get. And, of course, then that marriage quickly ended. I was actually uh, in Powell and then in, in the residential afterwards when I was served the papers and we divorced. So uh, You were in treatment when you were served papers. Uh, yeah, she went through the treatment with me. It was an outpatient treatment, and she was my uh, person that went with me, you know, and was there every night and everything and, and so forth. But she went through all of that. But then when I signed myself into residential, I'm not sure she liked that, and I think she had gotten a, a feeling that, you know, this guy's a loser. <laughs> and so uh, I need to cut my losses and get out of here now. And she did. And uh, so that was... You had no children together? No. Have you no. kept in contact? No, no. She disappeared. We were keeping in contact for the first few months or so, and she'd moved to Texas, and she was calling me periodically, and then suddenly the phone number changed, and she was gone. Mm. That was it. So, How did you deal with that? Well, um, at that point, I was getting well-grounded into a spiritual uh, recovery program. A recovery program meaning... The 12 steps, the 12 traditions, that's the program. Whichever one of those programs of 12 steps you go to, that's the program. And then I was starting to get involved in the fellowship, which is a part of recovery, but it's not the program. That's the people that practice the program. And so I was beginning to uh, do that enough that I sought that out and I spoke to people. And uh, getting out of myself and sharing who I really was and how I really felt and what was really going on, that was the difference that made it so that I didn't feel as though I had no choice but to use. I had options. And today I belong in what we call the no matter what club. Uh, it's a no matter what. I, am, I choose not to use today. Just for today, one moment at a time. Right, one day Just at for time. today. But I choose not to use. Now, that means I have to replace that with something else. So I have to reach out to other people, and I have to do those other things. If I do that, I can make it. Dennis is our guest today, 32 years in recovery. Uh, Back in 1983, he put the plug in the jug. He gave up everything, turned his life and his will over to the care of God. And uh, now, 32 years later, he's of great service. Uh, Any idea how many guys you've sponsored? A lot. But, uh, but I, I, I have this hard and fast rule. I never sponsor more than five. Five is a handful. Right. I never sp- – because, first of all, ego can get in the way. Ego can get in the way no matter, you know, how long you've had in recovery or whatever. In fact, it can get in the way more if you've had a long time in recovery. You start getting this grandiose opinion of yourself or something like that. And, and um, there, there's a, uh, a title of a book that I read back in the early 70s that I use all the time. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. And basically what it means is do not put anything on such a pedestal, no matter who or what it is, because we are all of like mind, and we all have our challenges. And so I try not to put myself there. And I, I have these reality check people that I check in with regularly. And so when I sponsor people, I'm very careful about that. Yeah, mine's three. Yeah, but mine used to be three for years. Yeah. For years. Well, how'd you get it to five? Because I can't, I mean, three, uh, three active guys, I mean, it wears me out. Now, it keeps me really sober. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the yeah. old saying that when you sponsor people, it really helps you stay sober. Oh, yeah. The guy that I've got now that's about, He's almost at nine months. Working those steps was like working them all over again for me. I loved it. But 
three guys at once? Well, one of my guys has 30 years in. One of them has 25 years in. Uh, then there's... Uh, I think the yeah the last three are there. There's one with there's one with two, and then there the other couple are kind of like yeah we don't know where they're going to be going yet. So it's that kind of a thing. It, it's a it, there's a big difference when you have those people that have been in long term and they're actively working. Those are the kind I like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are the best. I'll tell you. Yeah, so you're just talking about psychological problems. It's but not. I all yeah, you're just talking about life. Yeah. Right, right. And I also never work harder than they do. And yep. I tell them right from the right from the yep. jump, right from the very beginning. I say, I am a sponsor that sponsors people. That means we work the spiritual principles together. We work the steps and we work on them. I am not a sponsor in name only. I refuse to be a sponsor in name only. If you aren't calling me on some kind of a consistent regular basis and which step are we working on and what are we doing, then don't call me your sponsor because I'm not. Yeah. And I'm very clear about that from the very beginning. Yeah, I made that. I, I've made that mistake when I you work harder oh, yeah. than we've the all person we've you're all trying made to it. help. And it's like, yeah. wait a minute here. You only have to do it once. Yeah. Yeah, mine, mine was Cruiser, where mm -hmm. I just worked so much harder than he did. Yeah. Oh, and sure. Never rescue a willing victim, ever. I like that. <laughs> Our uh, guest today is Dennis, 32 years in recovery since 1983. And he now sponsors uh, several men. And uh, he's got a story that can help you remain sober, get clean, or help someone else get clean. How he got to 52883, the day he kicked it. That's coming up next, live here on The Truth. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate is free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee. To hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still fixed right or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile. That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. 
restoring hope Open my heart to sing Taking the darkness inside Revealing your light Restoring hope Two minutes, 22 minutes before the top of the hour on this, the third day of August in the Lord's year 2015. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is Restoring Hope Live, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC and Unity Point. My co-host, of course, Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat, uh, watching the chat, and Lila Stafford, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, certified uh, counselors at Powell, and uh, we hear a lot of the same stuff every week, don't we, Lila? But yeah. uh, uh, it always it, it always sinks in differently. Yeah. You know, we yeah. can hear something 10 times, and then Dennis says it for the 11th time, and boom, it, it, it sticks in. And uh, I like what you just said about a willing participant. What did you say about you say to your sponsorees? Well, I, I say I never rescue a willing victim. Oh. And if you're if if you're going to be a, a sponsoree and I'm going to be your sponsor, then that means we work the spiritual process. We work the program, which is the twelve steps and twelve traditions. And if we're not doing that, then I'm not your sponsor. Don't yeah. call me your sponsor. How many meetings a week do you go to? Well, because I'm retired now, believe it or not, I go to almost seven meetings a week. I yeah. hit, I hit to the daytime meetings at the particular fellowship that I belong to, and I'm a, I'm a, rep, a group representative for one of them, and and of course, you know, I do. I'm I'm very active in my recovery. Yeah, you had one of your sponsorees in here last week. Oh uh, no, he's not. He's not it's my just a friend. He's, yeah, just a friend. And, okay. and the program. Yeah. All right, so um, you finally gave it up uh, late in May of 1983. Correct. Tell me what was going on in your life about that time, and you can go back as far as you need to go. Well, um, I was a hot mess. I was one of those people that had just, uh, I had had enough. I would actually had enough about a year and a half before that, but I ended up... Uh, uh, signing myself in with kind of what I would call a nervous breakdown over to the uh, Sand Center, and I was in there for about a week or two, and they just basically told me, as I as I remember it at the time, uh, that well, you know, you really don't have the psychological mental problems of some of these people. You just need to stop using. And I was out on the street, and and I did on my own for a brief period of time uh, attempt to not you know to use anything. Thing, but because I didn't really have any outlets of connection to do that in a healthy way, I was back at it again. And then I got a job where I moved away from uh, the home area here to uh, Wisconsin and was there for about six or nine months or so and very involved in it. was kind of a political action organization and very involved in that and doing some things. But uh, you worked in the evening and then at night after everything was over, you kind of partied into the wee hours of the morning and boy, my addiction is really full full blue yet again and then i came back to uh des moines and and again was a mess and i had a relationship with a lady right out of high school and uh, we were in a relationship for seven years and that ended and then i went into a relationship with another lady and we got married and it was uh, all this stuff just uh extreme things happening uh ad addicts are extremists Mm -hmm. We are extremists in everything we think and everything we do. Um, you know, the, the there's no rheostat on that light switch. It's either it's on or it's off, and there's nothing in between. So that's kind of the way I was, and I reached that point yet again where I could not continue doing the things I was doing in the way that I was doing them and not suffer. I, I literally was having a breakdown, a meltdown at that time. I wanted to I wanted to die, but I didn't want to kill myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, the back and forth, the same thing. And something happened where I cried out. I know this sounds cliche-ish, but it is the truth for me. Uh, something happened, and I cried out to whatever's there. And I literally it hit my knees. It wasn't like I was trying to kneel down. It's like I collapsed to my knees. And I felt, you know how you'll get goosebumps all over I felt that like sensation of of uh, uh, electricity, energy, something, whatever it was, 
And I could no longer go back and do and be the person I was. Mm. I, I had to move forward. It was that simple. Um, and then that's when, when I found uh, um, a recovery place. Uh, I'd known about uh, a particular 12-step fellowship from years ago when my father had tried to get uh, in recovery himself. It didn't work, but he tried. And uh, so I knew about it as a kid, and I knew about this place that was at Methodist Hospital uh, on the third floor because at one point in time, right out of high school, I became a CNA, and I worked for a couple of years on Powell 5, which is a total knee and hip orthopedic floor, and I worked there. So I knew about this place. It was just two floors down. Went to see them, and they said, oh, I don't think you need us in here, but you need us out there. Sent us to this other little place, and I went to outpatient, and that's where I found the 12-step program that I belong to. And, uh, you know, kind of the rest is history, I guess. Now, what I heard you say, Dennis, was that you had a spiritual awakening. Yes, I did. The goosebumps. Yes, And I that did. came from you asking for that? Uh, crying out in desperation. Okay. You know, that, we, we have a thing that says we tried medicine and religion and psychiatry and all of these things having failed us in desperation. We sought help from each other in this particular fellowship. And, well, it was like that. But I, it was not that I was seeking a religious experience. It wasn't, I wasn't seeking a psychiatric one. I wasn't seeking uh, medical help, but I was seeking something, like I'd been seeking all along. But the door opened. I was ready. I had reached the point of no return. It was either go through that door or suffer and die. That sounds like, to me, a Holy Spirit experience. Yeah. Call it whatever we will. Well, but it's the same thing. Okay. Call it whatever we will. You're, you're going to have to come back on my, my view from a pew. I, I, this guy's making me itch. You can see it. Can't, <laughs> but I, I won't go down that road because Powell is not a uh, Christian organization or religious organization. They are an organization that does exactly what they do very well, and that's get people healed from alcohol and drugs. So... Uh, if you and I, if you'll do that for me, I'd enjoy that. Um, My so, um, you hit your knees. You said, God help me. And the, uh, obsession, I think, I think I said, whatever is there, help me. I didn't even call it God at that point. Okay. Yeah. But the obsession to use left you immediately. Yeah. 32 yeah. years. Has it ever come back? I mean, you've never well, relapsed. No, no. I, but it, uh, the uh, the obsession is not there, uh, nor is the real desire. But you know the inkling, I think, comes periodically. But that doesn't that that it doesn't necessarily mean it's in in the form of drugs. But it's in the form of using, in the sense that you know we use people sometimes. Like we withhold information when we know we should give it. We give it when we know we should withhold it. We manipulate. Um, you know, we lie. Um, we don't tell all of the truth. Um, we're, you know, those kinds of things are also using when you get to a certain spiritual place. Mm, mm, right. Mm, and, the, and again, this is the spiritual principles because I am a user. What do you have? Who do you have? When do you have it? How can I use it? You know, I have to turn my will and life over to the care of something greater than me, sometimes moment by moment by moment, but certainly every single day. I have to admit that I am powerless of my own self, of this brain disease that I have of in my mind. I am powerless over that. My life is unmanageable. My life is unmanageable. Do I believe that there's something greater than me that can restore me to sanity? If I get that out of the way, well, yeah, I do. Well, am I going to? That's the conscious decision. That's when you make that decision. And sometimes it has to be made moment by moment. It certainly has to be made every single day. All right, we're going to take our last break, come back, find out what Dennis's life is like now, what his focuses are. He's got a, a son that he's very proud of who is uh, pursuing a career in uh, film, I guess. Uh, we don't can't say video anymore, can we? That's just not a term even used. Boy, now I feel old. Uh, we're coming back later now with Dennis here on The Truth. A 
mother who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Restoring hope, open my heart to sing, taking the darkness inside, revealing your light, restoring hope. Third day of August in the Lord's year 2015. I'm Jay Michael McCoy. This is Restoring Hope Live, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC. They are there. I don't know if you knew they existed, but they are there. They are there to help you. Now, from the financial standpoint, they take all insurances. They can help you get the money you need together. That's not the important part. The important part is have you surrendered your will and your life to the care of God as you understand him? Have you? Because until you admit that your life is unmanageable and you can't do anything about this product, this disease, this thing you keep putting in your system that just messes you up, until you figure that out, until you realize you're insane, you keep doing the same thing over and over and over and expect to feel better, but you just feel worse. Oh, I know the buzz is nice. I know that. I've been there, done that. 1,917 days ago, I knew it every day. 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, love that buzz. 6.30, love that buzz. 8 o'clock, I don't know. Love the bed. Can't really, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of spinning, and the wife's not talking to me because she knows I've got that voice on now, and by 9 o'clock, I'm blacked out and in bed and awake the next morning at 5 o'clock, and I'll never do that again. I promise, Lord, I promise. Then at 4.30, I like the buzz. At 5, yeah, you get the story. Powell can relieve you of that. They can give you the tools through a 12-step program. They can give you the outpatient support. They can give you the aftercare. The only thing they can't give you is the will and desire to beat it, to kick its butt, to finally get it out of your life. The Satan, the Lucifer, the accuser, the devil, whatever you want to call him. It keeps making you make the wrong choice day after day after day. Yes, the good news is you are insane. There's a word for it. Insanity. The good news is there's somebody to help you, and that's Powell, CDC. 263-2424. Take advantage of it. Dennis is my guest, 32 years in recovery. Tell me what your life is like today. You have a, a a son that's just graduating from high school. Well, no, he has one more year. One more year. Yeah, okay. He just he just turned seventeen. So right. yeah, and he has one more year, and then he's graduating and uh, looking forward to the possibility of going to a an institute that's in uh, Minneapolis, and he'll be working. Brown. 
No. No. Okay. I've forgotten the name of it, actually, That's all right. at, the, at the moment. But uh, he'll be going there and, and doing the uh, uh, motion capture stuff and uh, green screens, yep. blue screen kinds of things. And uh, he's, he's very into uh, all kinds of video games and things. You need to bring him so. down here and let, yeah. you know, the verse over there show him the stuff we've got. And oh, yeah. I like don't that. These room, These walls are not painted green because... I like green. Right. We have green screen technology. Now, Lila claims they make her uh, tired. They do. <laughs> that green is a comforting color, and so they get tired. It can be. Um, are you married, man? Uh, no, but I, I have a significant other. Okay. Yes, she's, uh, uh, I've, I've been with her. She's been with me. She's tolerated me for eight years. So, yeah, we're, right. we've been together for some time. Are you time. in the program together? Uh, well, actually, she works a program, but it's a different one. It's it's kind of for the the people of uh, those that yeah. So and she's been in that for quite a long time. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you're retired. Yes, I am. So what do you are you just kind of like a full time twelve stepper? Pretty much now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I I used to work uh, in the field. I was. Uh, uh, registered with the state of Iowa, and I was an addictions counselor, and and worked in it for a number of years. And but this is kind of uh, uh, it's always been my uh, the the main go to. You know that I, I consider the twelve steps the spoke of the wheel um, as as far as like where my spirituality comes from, uh, because they say as you understand it. And that's very important. Uh, uh, that's the thing that, that made me uh, uh, solidified my decision to go with the 12 steps because it wasn't someone trying to tell me what their view was of something greater than I. Put it on the end of a plunger and shove it down my throat. I'd had plenty of that. Didn't need that. What I needed was the ability to, to find that within myself and to find it uh, in a greater connection with the outside world and to truly find it not, and experience it, not simply have kind of a general idea yeah. or from a textbook. So uh, the 12 steps are the hub of the wheel, and all the spokes that come off of that are the many aspects of how I connect into that which is for me. Uh, Dennis is our guest today, 37 years, I'm sorry, 32 years uh, in recovery. Uh, now, I we won't get into it for a long time because at some point my time's going to run out, so Frank will shut me up. But I like the uh, turn your life and your will over to a power of God as you understand him in the third step. However, I don't like that in the 11th step. Um, I, I, I believe that if you're heading down the right road, and you're working a spiritual program. By the time you get to 11, you understand God. Mm -hmm. They do. So I don't think the as you understand him in step 11 needs to be there. And I'm, I'm not, Lord knows I'm not going to change it. And I'm not going to teach my sponsorees or read it any differently. Right. Yeah, but people can under, not everyone has to have the same concept of them. You, and, um. But that's, uh, how, but. And if, if I, if I might point okay. it out here, here is, this is God. Now, you're seeing one aspect of God. You're seeing another. You are yet another, and I yet another. People up there may see it in a different way, and these here in a different way. Yet it is the same God. It's just that the way we see it is different. The paths are different, but the source is the same. There you go. Couldn't have said it better. I like it. <laughs> You can have him on your show. <laughs> I'm going to have Dennis. I'm going to have Dennis on my Christian show, The View from a Pew, and we're going to have an interesting conversation. And, and, and I may melt, but you know that's uh, <laughs> right oh, before I, you. <laughs> I doubt if you'll melt, but I, I I think you have a lot I want to learn about because uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a blessed man that uh, uh, a combination of this program and not this the radio program the the twelve step program. And the spirituality that I found, uh, I get a lot of young men and young or anybody under 50 <laughs> who come to me and I don't know how to deal so well with people who have your view of the greater power, the power greater than themselves. So I'd like to learn from you. I I'm not trying to convert you, but I'd like huh. to learn from you because I, I, I have an arrogance there 
You know, if you can't see the same Jesus that I can see, then you're not on the right path. And I know that's not the right attitude. And I want to work on that. So we'll do that one of these days if you'll come back and be my guest. I'd be blessed. That would yes, be God you. talking through him to you. Perhaps. Uh, well, let's hope. Uh, <laughs> Lila, thanks for being here. We'll see you next Monday. Uh, Bob, thanks for being here. Frank, thanks for producing. Dennis, thanks for being my guest. I'm J. Michael McCoy. Until we see again, uh, see each other again, do me a favor. And that person that you just, you just can't seem to forgive, w- would you do it tonight? Would you forgive them tonight? You gotta remember, as as you forgive, you shall be forgiven. I'll see you at church. Restoring hope.